All right, we've been um, in this series um, and uh, we're just continuing on with it. Uh, we're dealing with um, how to study the Bible um, and uh, we've gone through so many different things, man. It's, it's been a great ride, um, but um, we've been focusing in on the covenants. Um, now, uh, usually uh, you would just mainly deal with the main two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant, but we took this journey and we ended up uh, really starting all the way um, with uh, the Noahic Covenant and the Abrahamic Covenant. And now we are in the Mosaic Covenant um, and we're dealing with the canons that the surrounding stories of those covenants. Um, last week, we finally, actually two weeks ago, we finally got into the Mosaic Covenant. We've been in Abraham for a while and there was just a drastic shift. Um, that was one of the things that... Um, that I wanted to bring across last week was just the shift that took place uh, when they switched from one covenant to the next covenant, okay? It's important because a lot of people approach uh, the Bible as just this one big book, right? Just just one book and they, they see the author being Jesus. And um, while the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? Inspired, but it's written written by several different individuals written through different cultures, through different times, and uh, more importantly, written in different covenant periods, okay? And we're reading about different covenant experiences and periods. God is the same, Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. However, everything that we're reading through scripture, there, 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 there's clearly, I mean, you can't, I remember when I was younger, um, and people like, oh, the Bible just contradicts itself. I don't know how you could believe in a book that says this over here and this over there. And I used to try to defend it. It's like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't say two different things. It's just our understanding. Where We just don't understand it. We don't get it. Um, you know, you, you just, you know, don't discredit my Bible. And I used to take it very offensively because I, at the time, didn't know how to rightly divide. Paul told Timothy to rightly divide uh, so that he wouldn't feel ashamed. Um, I ended up feeling very ashamed, very offended because I didn't really understand. I, I took it very personal because you're, you're attacking. If you can, if you can say this says one thing over here and this said, and, and I can't, couldn't find a way to explain it. You guys don't know back in the day, I was like the, the as a, as a youth, I was like the Bible answer man. So I was always trying to pull up the scripture to, to outdo the other person. And, you know, oh no, I found this way to say it and this, and it, it was just, and I would run, I would run myself in circles, honestly, trying to defend, defend it until God really showed me, no, no, Charles, it, it, there are contradictions. They, one person may say this and another person may say this. I told you guys already uh, that um, if you read the Bible and you set, you set all the prophets in a room and, and just put them in a space and ask them one by one, what does God think of sacrifice? And they're all going to have different responses, right? They, they, would, they would represent different things because they were operating from the perspective and the understanding that they had. They were, they were looking through the filter that they had at the moment. There's things that we know about God today that they had no clue of. Even though God used them and moved through them mightily and used them to tell the story, to share the story, to get us to the place we are, there's still things we know today that they didn't know. Why? Because we get to see what God is our, is what, what God has always been like. We get to see Jesus. They didn't get to see Jesus. They didn't get to have Jesus come on on the inside. They didn't get to have him make his abode on the inside, to give us his spirit and, and his spirit come in. And I mean, there's just things that we have access to, understandings and truths that we have access to that they just did not have. Why? Because, right, there was a difference. There's a difference with the covenant that we have versus the covenant that they had, okay? And so it doesn't discredit the Bible. In actuality, when you, when you really understand how to rightly divide it, you actually see it as this, this, this man, incredible, incredible book that God has left us with um, to really teach us, to really grow us, and to really mature us. And so I'm grateful for that. And that's what we've been trying to do in this series is we've been talking about these things that essentially would not be usually talked about um, in a regular Bible study setting, right? These are things that you have to go to school to really learn. Um, and you, then you, you got to go to the right school because uh, some schools are just going to still keep you in this, in this vein 
of, of really um, being the dependent, okay? Being the dependent. One of the things that the call that we have as, 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 as preachers, right, as leaders is to actually uh, get, get, get the saints to the place that they can do the work of the ministry, right? To get them to the place that they can also teach, they can go out, they can heal, they can, they can deliver, they can speak, they can declare. The whole agenda is said to make disciples, right? Not to make dependents, not to keep dependents, but to keep people growing, growing in their faith, growing in their relationship with God, maturing, right? And so that's what we're doing, right? No reason to hold back these, these, these tools and, and all these different things. We all should have access. We all should have an understanding of these things. And so that's what we have really focused on in this, this series, right? We've talked about reader relevance, talked about audience relevance, talked about uh, historical context and, and really seeing things. Um, we're in, we're in uh, the Mosaic Covenant, and I, I kind of want to give us an understanding of the shift. Last week, we talked about uh, some things that happened. I just want to uh, highlight those things, and we're going to um, move forward. When I would preach this a lot of times at a guest, as, as a guest at, a, at another church, um, one of the ways that I would do this, I would talk about before the cross and after the cross. Well, what we're doing right here is last week we talked about before the law and after the law, okay? So we have essentially before the law, that was all the stuff we had been talking about, Abraham, right, Noah, right? It's all the things that came before Adam, all this stuff before the law. There, it's essentially like an age, it's a world, it's a, it's a period, it's a moment in time that was different than what happened after Exodus 20, up until Jesus' death. There was a shift that took place. Okay, there was a change. So we're talking about pre-law, right? And then, and then during the law, okay? Now, last week we said before the law was given, Exodus 15, 22, the Israelites grumbled at the start of their journey and it led to no punishment. But in Numbers 11, after the law, right? The Israelites grumbled and it led to a destroying fire. Exodus 16, uh, the Israelites grumbled about the manna and quail, and it led to no punishment. But after the law, after the law came into place, Numbers 11, the Israelites grumbled, and guess what? A killing plague came about. In uh, Exodus 16, there was a Sabbath violation that resulted in a reprimand. In Numbers 15, after the law, a Sabbath violation resulted in death by stoning. All right? In Exodus 17, the Israelites grumbled over the water and it led to no punishment again, right? And in Numbers 21, they actually do the same thing. They're grumbling about food, they're grumbling about water, and what happened? Here come deadly serpents, all right? Total different relationship. What took place? What took place? Well, what took place is they switched. They switched how they wanted to relate to God, all right? Now, God is trying to bring us into rest, just like them. All right. We've always talked about uh, looking at the scripture and seeing how does it apply to me. Right. Um, first thing we have to do uh, before we say that is we say, what would it have meant to the author? What would it have meant to the writer? All right. What would it have meant to the reader? Sorry. Then after that, once we have an understanding of the context, we can then say, well, how does this apply to me? Right. Well, when he's saying, I'm taking you into a place that, that has milk and honey, we know physically, right? Physically, he's not doing that. Physically, we're not having to come out of Pharaoh's captivity, right? But how could this be applied to me? How can I take this scripture and see if there's any application? Well, one of the applications that we could see is we, many of us are in a spiritual bondage, right? Uh, and we've been there before, or or it could be a situational bondage. It could be uh, something uh, that, that we're facing. could be a bondage to sin. It could be any type of different things. But what it is is the, the message doesn't change. God is the deliverer. He's the one that wants to bring us out of that place. All right? He wants to bring us out of that place. And where is he taking us? He's taking us to a place of rest. He's taking us to a place of promise. Now, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Physically, physically, they left, they left Egypt. But mentally, their mindset was still shaped. Their mindset was still shaped by Egypt, 
by Pharaoh. And we know this a lot of times when people try to transition, they try to transition from, um, from in a sense, a, a, a workplace where they are being told what to do, right? Someone else is giving them their, 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 uh, their, their agenda for the day, what their goals for the day. When they step out into maybe being an entrepreneur or running a business themselves, a lot of times there's a transitional period that takes place. It's, it's, this, it's this thing where they have to get used to, right, not being given all of these different instructions from someone else. But it's actually more comfortable, right, to actually to be in that space. Uh, my buddy would always say, uh, you know, scary scary slavery, sorry, uh, a secure slavery versus scary freedom, right? Over here, you have to now depend on, on different things. There's, there's different ways. You have to actually be responsible to, to come up with a plan, come up with the agenda. You have to actually what? Have dominion, right? Have dominion. So what did Adam have? Adam had dominion. He was given, he was given the same, uh, uh, essentially being able to live like God in the dominion, right? To be able to speak and see things happen, to be able to have rulership or control over things, to be able to, uh, to, to really to speak to things, to call things what they should be, to name things, right? That, were the, that was what Adam was walking in. However, as we shifted, we shifted after the fall, we began to be more comfortable, more comfortable with, with this Egypt type of scenario. Okay, where we get, right, we get what we work for. We understand, what is it? Okay, I get uh, $20 an hour. Um, I'm going to get this, this, and this. That, like, it's this, it's this thing that we're cool with. Now, this is, this is not, not everyone is actually called to have a, a, a business, right? Um, some of us have jobs that um, are essentially essential, and, it, it, and it's totally fine. You may be exactly where you're at. Don't take it. That is the point. Here's the point, though. All of us, whether we're entrepreneurs, whether we are uh, working at a job, it's this, it's this tendency to want to have, right, this, this set type of thing where I can see, I can see what you want. Okay, what do you want? And I will do what you want. And this is essentially what they did in Exodus chapter 19. Let me go over and share my screen. Exodus chapter 19. This is essentially what happened here. God had called them and he wanted to bring them into himself and to have them all be a priest, all be holy nation, right? But what do they want? They want to have commands that are given from a distance. Just give us our list. Just give, just tell us what you want us to do. And that's what we will do. All right. Look at this right here. Look at this right here. It says in verse uh, in verse uh, five, four. It says, "You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation." These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites, all right? And then Moses goes and he tells them, and he, they say, we will do everything the Lord has said, okay? They like this. They like how this is sounding. Now, I don't have, uh, we're not going to open up all of the, the, the tools that we have, looking at uh, some of the, the biblical dictionaries and commentaries and things like that, but I need you to understand this. In this statement, in this statement, it was more than a, okay, yes, yes, I'll obey. It was like, it was, it was there was a pride that was attached to this statement. It was sim the, the, the way that you can understand this is when Jesus tells, tells Peter, he says, Peter, you're going to deny me, right? And Peter's like, no, Lord, I will never deny you. It's that type of pride that they're operating. The, the language that's being used, the words that are being used, the syntax there, it speaks to this pride element that they made the statement in. In other words, 
This is exactly, I'm going to do it. I got this. It's going to, I'm going to carry out whatever. It is a, it's, it's in, it's a pride or it's a trust in self. Okay. This is the relationship that they asked for. And as a result, we shift into, right? We shift into um, him now calling Aaron and, and, and uh, Aaron and Moses up. Now look at this. We go over to Exodus chapter 20 and here's where we're at. He says, I am God, and I spoke all these words. Or God spoke all these words, and he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And then he now goes through all of the commandments. So now here come all of these commandments, okay? You guys want to live like this? You want to you wanna roll like this? All right, cool. You want to fail. You want, you want someone to govern you, right, that says do this or else. Do this so you can get avoid punishment do this so that you can you can get whatever it is the provision or this is the relationship that you want i'm trying to take you somewhere else okay i'm trying to take you into the promise i'm trying to take you into a place that's flowing with milk and honey right what what happens at they're struggling right day by day god was feeding them he was providing with them but what happened it was daily. It was something that they could not, they couldn't forecast it. I mean, they could if they trust in his goodness, but for them, they wanted to see it. They wanted to, to have it in their hands. And we've all been there before to where, okay, God, I'm going to roll with you, but look, this is what I need. I need to see this. Before you, I, you get me to believe this way or to trust you on that, I need to see this. I, I want to, I want this, this. Whatever it is, everybody has that bargain. Lord, I'll never do this again. I'll never speak this way again. I'll never go into a relationship like this again. But I need you to come to the table, and I need to see. We, we, have, a, a, we have a problem at times, a challenge at times, with adjusting, right? Adjusting to this, this relationship by faith. This relationship by faith. God, I know what you said. You said I'm going to have a son, but you know what? I'm not seeing. Hey, let me, let me holler at your, your handmaiden, right? They, 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 uh, we, we adjust. We need to see something. I'm not seeing God move. I'm not seeing it. And it, this, this relationship, they struggled with this. So they wanted a different type of relationship. They wanted a different type of relationship. They wanted one that was based upon what they were doing or not doing. And God said, this is what you want. Everybody's invited, but you just want one to go up. All right. Okay. Moses, Aaron, come on. Right. Aaron, you stay down here, Moses. Like, okay, cool. That's how we'll roll. That's what you're asking for. That's how we'll roll. God knowing that this would not work. He knew it would not work. He knew that it would not work. But what I love about God, the Bible tells us that there's no temptation that's not common to men, right? That's not common to men. In other words, that, that the things that we face, right, there's always going to be somebody else that has faced it. And many people, it's going to be a calm, like, I don't know if you've ever uh, been facing something, and you're like, man, I just, I feel this kind of way. And then you meet a couple people, and you think you're all by yourself, but then you're like, Wait, you feel that way too? I was on the call uh, earlier with Sister Estella, and I heard her say something similar. She was just glad to hear that someone else had this, a similar challenge, right? We've all been there, right? We're, 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 it's good to know that other people have gone through this journey. In those times for us, we can look back to Scripture, and we can see that other people have gone through this journey. They've gone, How does the Scripture grow us up? One of the ways is by the testimonies. The other way is by the trials to see that other people have had to trust God through some of the worst situations that could be imagined. Okay, they, they've had, they've struggled. You, you see it. God didn't clean up the pages, right? He left it all in there. He, he let us see all of the, 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 the dirty behind the, the scenes action, right? David, a man after his own heart, he could have left us there. But then he shows us David, a man after his own heart, but one who's getting another man killed so that he can get his wife. And ha like, that's some crazy stuff. How does that even come together? See, God left it all in there so that we could see. Now, the scripture says, 
that there's no temptation that's not common to man. But he also says here, he says that God will not allow for that temptation essentially to overtake us or to be more than what we can handle. And he says with that temptation, there is also a way of escape. I heard Ty Trivet preach one time, and he talked about how, how God had shown him this before, that, the, that, that he gave him an understanding of, of this scripture that, you know what, God said, look, there are situations and circumstances that you're going to face, but understand that that situation and circumstance is not allowed to be there. It's not allowed to be there unless there is a way of escape. In other words, he, he said, God, he said, God showed him. He said, look around at this building. Okay. This building truly is in order for it to be valid, in order for it to be verified, in order for it to pass the, the, the guidelines, right? They have to design this building with exits, with exits. Okay. They have to design the building with exits and they have to be clearly posted. So when you look around, you see, um, you can see the exit written out so that you know where to go in, in, in the uh, time where you would need to move out. And he said in that same way that God is not ever allowing for us. And this is where we have to have to be. I told Yvonne earlier today, I said, babe, you got the grace for this. What do I mean? AKA, there's an exit here. The exit is somewhere, right? We just have to be aware and find it. Now, they had an exit. God didn't allow for them to be put into this situation and, and say, okay, now you're stuck. You're, you're, you're stuck having to live according to yourself, okay, to what you're doing. No, they had an exit. Now, we don't see it here. Like someone say, okay, the exit was, well, if, if I don't, you know, if I don't make any images, right, any idols, if I keep that, like, that's my exit. It's like, no, that's not your exit. Your exit has to be something that you keep, that is your way of escape. This was not their way of escape. In other words, this was their trap. How do we know that this, Paul said that the law was given so that the offense would increase. The law was given. God knew that when he gave them the law, it would not stop sin. A lot of people believe that it's all these rules and all these things that a lot, of, there's, a, there's people that fight. There's, they always say, you know what, what changed about schools or what changed about our world is we started taking the Ten Commandments out of things. And you know what? I understand what they're saying because what the Ten Commandments did do is it restricted behavior, okay? It restricted, it constrained behavior. Okay, it constrained behavior. I'm going to go over to Galatians really quick, and then we're going to come back to here and look at what the way of escape was. Galatians chapter 4, it says, what am I saying? Is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Let's go to King James Version, because I want us to see this word. It'll carry the meaning a little bit better. I don't want us to miss this point. King James Version. All right, here we go. Look at this, that the heir, as long as he is a child, differ nothing from a servant or a slave, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Another, another way that it's been said is that, that essentially the law was a governor. The law was a tutor. The law was a schoolmaster, okay? It was, what it would do is it would give them guidelines, right? It would keep them. Um, I heard one preacher say this. He said, um, when you have a, a young child, right, a young child, and you talk to the young child, maybe a toddler, and you say, hey, son, I don't want you to cross the street right now. Because if you cross the street, you know, there are cars out there that, that are coming, and there's all types of danger and you're gonna make your parents sad and this could happen and that could happen and all this stuff, right? Usually 
at a certain age, they do not have the ability to comprehend all that. So what, what usually did the, did the parent implement? They implemented some type of uh, pain versus pleasure, right? They moved them in that way. Those are the most, if you guys don't know how we're designed, we're designed in that way. Those are our greatest influences to go away from things that are painful and to run towards things that are pleasurable. It's, it's within us, right? And so what, what, what the father would do is some, some would use spanking techniques, some would withhold things, they would take things, but what, whatever, whatever would identify to the child as pain, right, would be the reason why they would not do the thing. So they're not going to be able to logically and really break that down from a logical place. But what they could understand is I did this. And the last time I did this, it led to this punishment. It led to this pain. Okay. So the law, right? The law is for essentially staying a child, right? Staying a child. But do you know what? There are some times where we see the parents shift right? They bring them, it's like, okay, it's time for them to grow up, right? And so now they're having to make decisions themselves. They're having to make choices themselves. Now, this is the same thing that happened, right? Under the law, they had a schoolmaster. They were led by the law, meaning, how do I live? Well, you get up, here's your list of things that you need to do. You need to remember to keep the Sabbath. You need to make sure that you're not lying on anybody. You need to make sure you're not coveting anyone else's wife. You need to make sure, and there's this list that they have. And they, and they could follow the list that this leads to pain, this leads to pleasure. Deuteronomy 28, this leads to blessed will you be, blessed will you be, blessed will you be. Then go on, cursed will you be, cursed, right? That's a very childish way of moving with people, okay? But when the fullness of time came, verse 4, it says that God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law so that we might receive the adoption of sons. Look at verse seven or six. It says, and because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. No more a servant, no more a slave, but a son. And if a son, watch this, and if a son, then an heir. What does an heir have? The heir has full access. The heir has full access. They can move. They, they, they can, they, they, there's, there's, there's freedom, right? There's, there's authority, right? Full access. So he understood that for this period of time, the law was going to be used as a schoolmaster, as a tutor, as a governor. But it was never designed to bring them into the promise. We're going to get into this later, but I have to say this now because it just came up. It was never designed to get them into the promise. Watch this. Who brought them into the promise land? Joshua. Joshua brought them into the promised land, but also Joshua was a type of Christ. It's the same, it's the same name. It was Jesus. It was Yeshua that would bring them into the promise. Okay? Moses could not. Moses could not. Look at this really quick right here. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. Okay, so watch this. For us to enter in, we have to shift out of this childish relationship. We have to allow for the law essentially to die, for us to move into a relationship where we are walking by the Spirit, where we receive the Spirit of grace that now allows for us to come into the, the place of promise, into the place of rest. But we cannot enter the place of rest outside of the Spirit of grace, outside of the freedom that comes with Christ, outside of that. All right, so I don't, I don't want to spend too much time there. I want us to show, we said, he, he put inside that the way of escape was always inside. It had never shifted. Watch this. 
Now, notice what he says. He says, honor your father and mother. Don't commit murder. Don't steal. Don't give false witness, right? Don't lie to anybody. All this stuff, okay? All of this stuff he says. And it says in verse 18, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Okay, they went from an invitation to be there as kings and priests, to be there as a holy nation, to have access, right? Everyone being able to talk to now having this relationship where they have someone go before them and represent them. And they're fearful. Okay, they're fearful. Now, watch this. None of this, through none of this did God say he was going to bless them. None of this, the blessing was never connected to any of this. I told you that God put in the system the way of escape. Watch this. Here's the way of escape. Look at verse 24. Make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your fellowship offerings, your sheep, your goats, and your cattle. And wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. I will come to you and bless you. Well, hear what happened here. He gave them all the commandments, said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this. But he said, the blessing is right here. The blessing comes from when you give the sacrifice. In other words, in other words, it had always been God's intention to bless them through the sacrifice. I don't want us to stop at sheep and goats. I want us to take this further and think about what this was. This was showing them that it was not going to be in their ability to keep all the commandments. Their blessing was going to be in their ability to stay committed to this system of sacrifice. In other words, receiving the blessing through the sacrifice. What was ultimately the sacrifice that would cause us to step into the true rest, to step into the true place of promise? The sacrifice was Christ. Christ was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. God had always intended to bless us through the sacrifice. And even when he first gave them the law, he still gave them the pattern. The pattern was going to be that God would bless us through the sacrifice. And so what you see is that God, you would see God's favor on Israel, not because they weren't stealing and not committing. They were definitely doing that. Jesus shows up and he shows them, look, you thought you weren't murdering, but I'm telling you, if you already thought this, right? You thought you weren't committing adultery, but I'm telling you, if you if you've already had this type of thought, you've already done it. He's telling them, y'all have never been keeping my commandments the way that you needed to, to be able to receive a blessing. What was it? It was always about the sacrifice. And what you would see is Israel, as long as they were honoring God and they were making sacrifices unto God, they were doing what he said, that is where you would see the blessing. Where you would see, if you study and see where Israel would turn, it was where they would begin to go. What was the issue of going with other, uh, with the, he had, they had instructions not to even go to other camps and, and associate with other women. Why? Because those people, they had different practices. And their practice was not to go and to offer a sacrifice to the Most High God. Their practice was to do it to their gods. So what you would see is whenever they would hook up with people from other cultures and things, they would leave their way of doing things. And that's where they would fall into, you would see them really lose their kingdom or you would see them lose their, their power or their authority. But God had always, the secret was not the commandments. The secret was that they would continue to honor God and to offer the sacrifice. All right, we're going to pick this up next week, but I want us to see this, that he had already built in the way of escape it was always going to be through the sacrifice. Why? Because it was always going to be through the lamb that was slain. All the promises of God are yes and amen, but they're in Christ. They're in Christ. They're in Christ. So Christ is our rest. Christ is our Sabbath. 
And so as long as we keep the focus and attention uh, and, and attention on Christ, we can stay in that place of blessing. But when we shift the, when we shift the attention to ourselves, what we're not doing, Peter, we talked about it Sunday, Peter stepped out on the water. And as long as his focus was on Christ, he was fine. But when he shifted to his own ability, his own ability to, to walk on water, to stay afloat, to avoid all the winds and the circumstances, that is when he began to sink. God already put inside of this system the way of escape. And it was going to be through the sacrifice. It was going to be through what Christ would do, through his death, his resurrection, his ascension. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your love. We thank you that in you we find our peace and our rest. We thank you that in you we find, Father God, everything that we need. And we just thank you for that sacrifice that we have from Jesus. Thank you for the righteousness that we've been given through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father God, that you've taken our sin and you've, you, you, you've separated you've separated as far as the east is from the, the, the west. I thank you that you removed us from it. You're, you're no longer even looking at us through that lens but you see your son, you see your blood, you see, Father God, the sacrifice that was made. And so I thank you that we are sons. We're no longer slaves. We are sons and we are heirs. And we thank you for all that we have. We receive our inheritance tonight. And we just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.